Good evening. Lori says, good morning. Good afternoon. Where am I? Who am I? How many of you here were, were here last night? May I see a show of hands? Well, you can go home. The rest of you can stay. No, I'm just kidding. Let me, before I start, I promised a friend of yours and a friend of mine that I have to say this. But seven years ago, I was lecturing in Ohio, and a priest, a legionnaire, a Christ priest, came up to me and said, Tony, you really touched me. He says, I'm going to make all the arrangements possible to send you to New Zealand. I said, New Zealand? He says, where's New Zealand? He said, near Australia? I said, that's on the other side of the world. He says, that's right. But I think God and the Blessed Mother need you there, Tony. I said, go ahead, Father, pray about it. Seven years later, a young... Seven... Seven years later, I was speaking in the same place, and a young man comes up to me and says, Tony, you really touched me. I'm going to make arrangements to send you to New Zealand. I said, where have I heard that before? And he said, I'm serious. I'm going to do something about it. And before I knew it, I'm getting emails and faxes and phone calls from John Porteous and Bill Moore. And all of a sudden, I'm here. And that young man wants to say hello to you. His name was Joe Mormon, the tenor. You remember him last year, because you were here. And he says... He says he loves you, he misses you, and he's going to do everything possible to be back. Whether you invite him or not, he's coming back, so get ready for him. Let me start out by sharing a story that relates to you. It happened 15 years ago, but this definitely relates to all of you. And I hope you will remember it, not just during these two days of the convention, but for the rest of your lives. Fifteen years ago, I was invited by a big, large, charismatic group in Wilmington, Delaware, the state of Delaware. For those of you who are not familiar with the United States, Delaware is between Philadelphia, where we live, and Washington, D.C. They scheduled me for a Saturday morning, and um, we had no idea how many people would show up. Normally, Saturdays, people go shopping, or they sleep late, or they clean the house, but 400 people showed up, and the title of my lecture was Miracles and Why I Believe in Them. Just as I'm being introduced, I was standing next to the podium, and guy in charge of the schedule me, he was introducing me when somebody tapped me on the shoulder, so I turned around, and it was a beautiful young lady about 30 years old, and she says, excuse me, Mr. Zuniga, but do you allow children to listen to you? She says, I don't care who listens to me, why? He says, can you wait, don't talk until I go get my son, I want my six-year-old son to listen to every word you have to say. I says, I'm getting ready to go on. I live right across the street from the church, I'll be back. So she dashes out, and 30 seconds later, she's sitting in the front row. So I began my talk, I said a prayer to the Holy Spirit, and then this is what I said, and this is what's going to relate to you. I said, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Now I want you to do me a favor. As a matter of fact, I want you to do yourselves a favor. I want you to forget about tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. Seriously. As a matter of fact, there is no evening. The only time we have is right now, this moment of precious moment of now that God has given us to be together. Don't be thinking about what you're going to do later, because it's not even here. Some of you perhaps are going to go shopping. Some of you are worried about what you're going to wear to church tomorrow on Sunday. Some of you are concerned about your job on Monday. You say, we haven't even left Saturday. You're already worried about things that, that have never happened. This is why children are the happiest people in the world. They don't care what happened yesterday. They're not concerned about the future. They only enjoy today. So be with me today. I see 400 bodies, but I don't know where your hearts or your minds or your souls are. Let me show you my heart and... Treat it gently and let me see yours. It's not my mouth that's speaking, because if it were, my words would go in one ear and not the other. So, please be with me. Let's enjoy it. Now, when you go through life, I don't care if it's tomorrow or next year, I want you to remember that it, when you're ready to do something, don't say, I'll do it tomorrow, because there is no tomorrow. Our Archbishop from Philadelphia, Cardinal Crow, the late Cardinal Crow, also came to come for confirmation at our parish, and he said basically the same thing. If you're going to be here, be with me, be with the Holy Spirit, with his children. There is no tomorrow. Nobody can guarantee us that we will be alive tomorrow. The ceiling could fall down, he said, and kill us all, God forbid. But be here with me. So I told the people there, I said, uh, please remember these words. There was a young girl who wrote a beautiful poem. It turned out to be a poem. It was a letter to, his, to her boyfriend. And this happened many years ago. Let me read you that letter. This is my dear John. He says, remember the time that I invited you to come and dance to a dance, and uh, I forgot to tell you that the dance was formal and you showed up in blue jeans? I thought you were going to yell at me, but you didn't. 
And remember the time I forced you to take me to the beach and shore so we could go swimming and you said it was going to rain and it did. I knew you were going to say, I told you so, but you didn't. And remember the time that I spilled ice cream and blueberry pie on your brand new car? I thought you were going to scream at me, but you didn't. And remember the time that I went out with other guys to make you jealous? I knew you were going to come and tell me, I'm going to leave you, but you didn't. Yes, there were many things that I did to embarrass you, to hurt you. So I made up my mind that I was going to make it all up to you when you came back from Vietnam, but you didn't. The only moment she had was when she was with him. This is why I'm asking you today, because this little boy that the mother brought at the last minute apparently listened to me very attentively. The next day on Sunday afternoon, I received a phone call and I picked it up and this woman is crying. She says, I'm the woman who asked you if you allowed children to listen to you. Apparently my son listened to you so much that I owe you his life. He says, uh, he's alive because of you, Tony. I said, no, not because of me. What happened? He says, this morning at seven o'clock mass, we always sit in the very back pew on the bench in the very back in case he gets restless, he wants to go outside or go to the bathroom. But this morning, because of what you said, he listened very attentively and then all of a sudden, as the priest is giving the homily, he turns to me and says, Mommy, there's something I have to tell you. Shh, wait till after Mass. Mommy, it's very important. I have to tell you now. Wait till the priest stops talking. Mommy, Tony said this is the only moment we have. So he says, I turn around and says, what is it? I know my father left you three years ago when I was three years old, and you've been struggling, taking care of me. All I want to tell you, Mother, I'm very proud of you, and I think you're very beautiful, and I love you very, very much. I had to tell you right now. And the little boy jumps and hugs his mother real tight and gives her a kiss right here on the cheek. At that precise moment, the exact moment when the little boy jumps up to hug and kiss his mother, a big, heavy chandelier right over the boy's head broke, and it came crashing down. And right where the boy was sitting, missing him by one inch, and they all fell to the ground, everybody screamed, the priest had to stop mass to see if everything was safe, move the other people from under other chandeliers. And then, so she tells me, you saved his life. I says, I don't save lives, God saves lives. But apparently God has a plan for your son. This is your job from the, now until the day you die. Every moment that you spend with your son is a very precious moment. Talk to him, listen to him, encourage him. That was 15 years ago. Today, that little boy is in the seminary, about to be ordained as a priest. The question, the question that I ask myself very seriously every once in a while when I think about it, what if I had told this mother, no, I don't want children to listen to me, they're very disruptive or they bother me. Would that boy be alive today? I don't know, but all I know is that a wonderful thing happened that morning and the greatness of God descended upon all of us. Let me briefly talk a little bit about myself, because if I were sitting there and some of you have never seen me before, I would like to know who is this guy talking to you. I was born in South Texas of Mexican parents. Both my father and mother were from Mexico. And I have a Mexican name, as I said last night, some of you were here last night, it's not Tony Zuniga. And if you were to read my baptismal record or my birth certificate, it's written Antonio Zaragoza Zuniga de las Casas de los Palacios. And as a friend of mine, <laughs> and as a friend of mine in Dallas, Texas, I said, "Boy, what a name! If I could memorize it, Tony, and say it real loud and real fast after every meal, I don't need any dental floss to clean my feet." <laughs> I'm married to a beautiful lady from Nashville, Tennessee, by the name of Mamie Alice. Some of you have met her out there, where I have my books. We have nine children: six boys and three girls, and eight grandchildren. And uh, two years ago. Two years ago, in 1998, Mamie and I celebrated our 50th golden wedding anniversary. And uh, our children threw us a surprise party to end all parties. People came from all over the world, from Spain, from Puerto Rico, Mexico, Canada, Hawaii, and across the United States. As Frank Sinatra would say, it was a blast. And we really enjoyed ourselves. My professional job has always been in radio, television, and communications. I worked three years for Pan American Airways when it was the world's largest airline in Brownsville, Texas, and in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Then I worked 10 years for the Lyndon B. Johnson, yes, the President of the United States. He had a whole stack of radio and TV stations in South Texas, and I operated and built some of them. In 1958, when my father and mother died, 
I told Mamie, I said, let's see where God needs me. And the Philco Corporation, I don't know whether you ever remember the old Philco Corporation from Philadelphia, offered me a job in South Korea. And I went to Korea for a period of a year and a half to two years installing television stations for the Army. Right after that, when I reported back to Philadelphia for my next, next assignment, uh, they asked me if I wanted to work in Philadelphia. I said, it won't cost you a penny. We'll fly your family and your furniture. I said, why not? So I picked up the phone and I called Mamie. I said, start packing. We're moving to Philadelphia. And we've been there since 1959. Three years later, the Ford Motor Company came and bought the Philco Corporation. And they moved it to the West Coast. They wanted me to come along, but my family did not want to move. So then I joined the broadcasting company. My last job, 20 years, was with the NBC television station in Philadelphia, the largest TV station there. The first 10 years was with the Mike Douglas show. How many of you here ever heard of Mike Douglas? Yes? No? Mike Douglas was a talk host show, a talk show that he hosted movie stars and personalities. And I think Bill Moore wrote in one of the pamphlets about me. He said he was there with all the saints and the sinners, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I got a chance to meet just about everybody you can think of, uh, mostly Stars that I met are dead, like Hugh Brenner, Lawrence Welk, um, Gene Autry, John Wayne, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, and, and some are still living. But I also had a chance to meet Mother Teresa of Calcutta, which taught me a big, big lesson, and I'll be talking about her tomorrow when I speak about stewardship. Also, I met the late Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, who became a good friend of mine, and he also taught me a big lesson about God the Father, and I'll be talking about him tomorrow when I speak about stewardship. After, After the, the Mike Douglas, Douglas show came to an end and went into history, I was given a big promotion, a big, big promotion, a big raise, and a lot of responsibility. The Holy Father showed up in Philadelphia, and I was in charge of televising him. I had a lot of technicians, producers, directors. After he left there for a week, he gave me a hundred medals that he blessed with his hands and told me to distribute them for my staff. What the Holy Father did not know was that 98% of my staff are Jewish and they could care less for the medal, so I kept them. So I gave them to my friends and I just kept two. One I gave to my wife Mamie and I kept one for myself. After that, because of my promotion, I got a lot of invitations to speak at communion breakfast, luncheons, to the Knights of Columbus, the Blue Army, Legion of Mary, in schools, universities, I would begin to travel. And then it got out of hand, I couldn't control it, it was non-stop. And miracles began to happen. I spoke at West Point, at the United Nations in New York. I spoke in the Pentagon. And I mean, they were inviting me right and left. And finally, I went to see my spiritual director because miracles were happening right in front of my eyes. A woman who was blind all of a sudden recovered her sight. Another woman, another young man who couldn't speak, all of a sudden he's talking. And uh, I couldn't understand it. So my spiritual director said, Tony, apparently God is leading you in a new direction. Don't be afraid. Hold on to his hand and let him take you wherever he wants to. It's going to be scary, but God knows you better than anyone else in the world. Well, I asked God in my own way if I was supposed to do this for the rest of my life to show me how to do it. And God answers prayer. You know that, and I know it. But not when we want him to answer it, not how we want him to answer it, because I had an accident at home. I came tumbling down the steps. I thought I broke my neck. What happened? I couldn't get up. And I broke my tailbone, my coccyx bone. It was shattered in a million pieces. And the sacrum bone right above next to the spine also was cracked. I couldn't walk. I suffered for four months in torture, in agony. Mamie doesn't even want to remember those four months. And then I began to talk to God and God was telling me I need to forgive. And there was a family in California I didn't want to forgive. Finally, I humbled myself before God, and I asked forgiveness. We cried, we prayed, we forgave each other, and then it happened. I'll describe it the way it happened, the way I still remember it. But I was thrown out of the bed onto the floor, and people who interview me on radio and television said, wait, 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 Tony, hold, hold it. What threw you out of that? I said, I have no idea. Maybe it was my guardian angel. Maybe it was God himself. All I know is that my body was picked up and dropped. And I'm a very heavy man, and when I hit the floor, hardwood floor, the first thought that hit me, besides yelling and screaming, I was scared, I didn't know what was happening. The first thing I said was, if it wasn't broken before, it's really shattered now. And then I'm concerned about how to get back on the bed because I didn't want Mamie to find me thinking I had a heart attack. So when I stretched my arms slowly towards the bed, nothing hurt. And I said, wait a minute, what's happening here? So I pushed on the floor and lifted my back end up and down and nothing's hurting. I said, God, you're beginning to scare me. So then I put my hand underneath 
and I began to feel and touch. And before this, I couldn't. Nobody could get near me. It was so sensitive, so tender, so so painful. And all of a sudden, I'm hitting myself, and nothing's hurting. I says, "God, you're scaring me. Is this supposed to be a miracle?" And this time, I heard a voice, a clear voice, audible voice. He says, why don't you get up and walk? And I answered the voice, it better not hurt. So I set up and I jumped up and I'm like a little kid at Christmas, hitting myself in the back, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. I know miracles happen, but not to Tony and not now, maybe 2,000 years ago they happened. So I ran up and down the steps and I'm completely healed. When Mamie came from school, I think she was in college at the time with my daughter, they were shocked. They says, what happened? I says, so I told them. And they said, you're making it up. I said, well, you want to hit me? So, so we went, went to see the doctor. The doctor wanted to operate and take the whole tailbone out. They say they do those operations once in a while. But he looked at the x-rays again, he took an x-ray and there was a crack in there. It was an instantaneous healing. So, thank you. So then, I asked God, I said, what does this mean? Why, why, why did I have the accident? Why did I suffer for four months and why was I healed instantaneously? A month later, I was invited to go to California and speak to a large corporation. The man who invited me, a Mexican by the name of Henry Gonzalez, was very happy with the two-day conference, and then he takes me out to dinner. It was at this restaurant in downtown Los Angeles that I told him about my miraculous healing a month before. And his eyes get big and bigger. He said, maybe you came for another reason, Tony. I said, what are you talking about? He said, maybe you came to heal my sister. I said, your sister? What's wrong with your sister? He said, she's dying of cancer. I said, hold it. Nope, 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 nope. I said, I don't want to get involved. I wouldn't even know what to do, how to pray, what to say. We were in that restaurant for four hours, and he's crying and begging and pleading. He said, she's very young. She's 33 years old, and she's got 30 days left to live. Please come and see her. Talk. I said, what will I say? Why don't you let God take over and let him? He'll tell you what to say and what to do. So after four hours and 40 cups of coffee, and the, the waitress threatening to throw us out, I decided that maybe he was right, so I went to see her. And uh, I talked to her alone. Her name was Rosie. She was a Mexican beauty, to end all beauties. I've seen many beautiful women in my life. She wanted to see the world. She could have been a movie star, but she wanted to see the world, so she became a teacher in Germany, teaching children of American servicemen. And it was there that she fell in love with a German man. She married him. They have two little girls. One was nine years old and the other one was 11. And then five years before, later, or after, when he was telling me five years before that, they divorced and she didn't want to talk about her divorce. A year later, she got real sick. She went to see an American doctor in Germany, in Munich, and they found out she had a cancer in her ovaries, an ovarian cancer. It was malignant. It was out of control and it was spreading throughout her whole body. So they sent her home to die. She had 30 days left. And with this, in my mind, I'm supposed to go see her, find out what I'm supposed to do. When I got there, I talked to her, and I said, listen, Rosie, I'm going to put you through a three-point plan that only God, you, and I will know about, and then we're going to do this plan for 30 days. I had no idea what a three-point plan was. It just came out, it came out so natural, and that's when I began to believe that when I get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit take over, beautiful things happen. So she interrupted me, and I'm glad she did, because she said, why did you say we're going to do this plan for 30 days? I said, well, your brother told me last night in the restaurant, you have 30 days left to live. She says, I'm scared, Tony, I really am scared. I said, well, I would be too, Rosie, except for one thing. In about two hours, I'm getting on an airplane to fly back home to Philadelphia. That airplane could crash. And I may be dead in less than 30 hours, not 30 days. You might not leave me. So I said, let's not worry about dying or death. I said, let God take us when he's ready to take us. I said, let's live today. This is the only moment we have. She said, OK. What's the first point? I said, God, what is the first point? <laughs> and when I opened my eyes, there was seriously, there was a little green neon sign on, on top of her left shoulder, and it was blinking. To this day, I'm still wondering why it was green. It could have been blue or red. And, it, and the sign said, prayer, prayer, prayer. And it went over her head, and I followed it. I said, prayer. <laughs> and she said, we're praying. Everybody's praying. I said, but you're praying the wrong way. She says, what do you mean we're praying the wrong way? But what are you praying for? Says, everybody's praying that I be healed. I said, wrong. You mean we're not supposed to pray that I get healed? Absolutely not. I said, what are we supposed to pray for? So I told her the story of my tailbone and the miraculous healing. I said, during the four months, Rosie, that I've suffered, and only God and I know how much it was painful and how much it hurt, not once did I ask God to heal my tailbone. It was when 
I told him, I said, I need, I need to know what, how I have deviated from you. And God told me, you need to forgive someone. And I forgave the people in California that I didn't want to see. I humbled myself before God, not before these people. And when the, heal, the forgiveness took place, the healing took place. What I'm trying to tell you, Rosie, is that spiritual healing has to come first before the physical. It works that way. God, you love God more than anything in the world, believe me. God will take care of you. All he has to do is let it be done according to my will. And whether you have a tunic, a toenail, a lupus, or leukemia, or cancer in the ovaries, it's done. You're healed. So what we're going to do for the next 30 days, Rosie, we're going to pray that you get back in the path of God. We call it in the state of grace in the Catholic Church. And then you'll be healed. Okay, I think you're right. He says, I'll pray that. And don't forget about the healing. God will take care of that. Just get closer to God. Okay, what's point number two? I says, Rosie, forgive me for saying this, but there's a knuckliness inside of you. As beautiful as you are on the outside, there's a lot of dirt. And you have a lot of anger and frustration and bitterness. Apparently, you hate somebody. You've got to get rid of that anger. That anger is going to kill you before the ovarian cancer you have. Finally, she realized that perhaps she was right because she was yelling at her mother, yelling at her children, yelling at her brother. And she finally admitted that she needed to control her anger and come out with him. I said, look in the mirror every day, Rosie, and tell, thank God for the beauty, the outside beauty, those beautiful brown eyes, jet black hair, those ruby red lips. And she had a beautiful body too. So I said, but ask God, help me to discover the beauty that's trapped in my heart so that it can come out and, and be at peace with the world. And don't be surprised that in 30 days or less, your cancer will disappear. He said, you're making sense. What's point number three? I said, well, if you didn't like point number two, <laughs> you're going to hate me for point number three. Your brother told me last night that uh, you don't want to talk about your divorce. He says, that's right, I don't want to talk about it. I said, we are going to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. We are going to talk about it. Listen, Rosie, listen very carefully. I don't care what happened between you and your husband. If you feel like telling me just to get it off your chest, so to speak, I'll listen. And nobody will ever know about it. I'll become like a priest in the confessional. I said, it'll die in here. But only if you feel that you need to tell me. I don't need to hear this. I don't care what happened. Because listen carefully, Rosie. I don't care if he beat the heck out of you every night. I don't care if he got drunk every night. I don't care if he never supported you. I don't care if he had seven mistresses and slept with a different woman every night of the week. I don't even care if he molested your two daughters. What I do care beginning today and for the rest of your life, and you could live a long time if you listen to me carefully, you're going to have to forgive him completely, totally, unequivocally. Give him back to God with all the love and compassion that's in your heart. And she yelled at me, I gave him back to God a long time ago. I already forgave him. I said, Rosie, you told me in the beginning that we would speak the truth. I'm speaking the truth. I already forgave him. Okay, Rosie, if there was a knock on the door right now, and you said, I wonder who that is, I said, answer it. And you open the door, and there's your ex-husband. Standing there, he just flew in from Germany. Could you look at him and say, honey, what are you doing here in California? Could you run up there and hug him and kiss him? You don't know what that SOB did to me! I said, I said, Rosie, I just finished you telling you. It makes no difference what, what he did. You have to forgive him. You have no choice. I'll never forgive him. She said, never, never, never. He can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. So I, I got pushed up. I really felt like, so I started walking towards the kitchen. And uh, listen, Rosie, let's have a quick cup of tea or coffee. I've got to get back to the airport. I don't want to miss my plane, but I'll be back in 30 days. And she turned around and says, you'll be back in 30 days for what? I said, for your funeral. I said, your brother will call me, and uh, out of respect for the family, I'll be here. You know who's going to cry at the funeral? Your two daughters, your mother, your brother. But I'm going to cry the hardest and the loudest. Yesterday, I didn't even know you existed in this world. Last night, I rejected you for four hours in a restaurant. I didn't even want to see you. But now that I'm here, why aren't you listening to what God is telling you through me? Is forgiveness... Listen, Rosie, you think it'll solve everything if I go to Germany and put a bullet in his brain and kill him for you? You think that solves everything? Do you realize that the more you hate someone, the harder it is for that person to save his own soul? Hatred is that way, and so is love. The more you hate someone, that per your husband is finding a very difficult time trying to get back into the harmony of God himself. You think God is up there saying, oh, Rosie was right, he was wrong. God loves us all. You made a mistake, there was a separation. But God wants you to live in peace and in love together. He could be your best friend. And uh, she said, is forgiveness possible? It's not only possible, it's necessary. As Herbert Marshall once said, the one who does not forgive burns the bridge over he or she has to pass someday. So I says, Jesus, who was tortured, whipped, crowned with thorns, dragged, humiliated, and hung on a cross for three hours. The first words from the cross were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Without forgiveness, Rosie, there is no love. Without love, there is no God. And without God, there is no salvation, period. So she started to cry and said, you know, you're absolutely right. I guess I have to pray every night. Remember the good days you had together. And then you realize how beautiful life can be when you learn to forgive. Would you believe it? 30 days later, she calls me on the phone that the cancer disappeared completely. And I said, praise the Lord. So, uh, she said, she said that she was, she was going to make arrangements for me to go to Germany, because she was going back to Germany. And two weeks later, I got a letter from a two-star general in the army, inviting me to speak at all the schools in Germany. I went and more miracles began to happen. Transformation. And I came home, I told Mamie, let's get back in the closet and start praying again. I didn't know where God wanted with me. But at the end of 30 days of prayer, Mamie received the same answer that I did, that I couldn't serve two masters either. I stayed at the TV station making tons of money, enjoying the good life. Medjugorje, Germany, Japan, Korea, and across the United States, Hawaii, Canada, hundreds of times to Puerto Rico and Mexico, and I've never lacked for anything. People say, well, how do you make a living? I say, people give me things, they send me checks, people buy my books and tapes, and I don't, you know, I don't insist that you're supposed to buy them, but if they want to help me, they take tapes or books home. So we come to a year that to me is very significant. I hope you will remember this year, 1981. I sincerely believe that 1981 was the point of no return for humanity in this world. Everything happened in 1981. Our Holy Father was shot and survived. President Ronald Reagan was shot the same year and he survived. The President of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, was shot and he died. The first airplane crash in Yugoslavia took place in 1981. They discovered the menace of dread, deadly disease of AIDS in Georgia, in the state of Georgia in the United States in 1981. But something beautiful happened in 1981, which you all know about. Our Blessed Mother came down from heaven in a little village known as Medjugorje and appeared to six children. She came as the Queen of Peace and a lot of people said perhaps for the last time. But also something else more beautiful happened also right after that. On December the 2nd of 1981, our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, announced to the Catholic world that if at all possible to do everything in their power, any sacrifice that was needed, anything that they had to do to try and have perpetual adorations in every Catholic church in the world. Some churches listened, some didn't, and worse than that, some didn't even care. Our pastor in Our Lady of Fatima, where we recited, Father John Griffin, which I mentioned in my book, decided immediately that he wanted to have perpetual adoration Six days later, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December the 8th, we up, opened up our church to perpetual adoration. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and it's been going on since 1981. There were two hours, God bless, praise the Lord. There were, two, there were two hours missing there, and I took them. I says, I'll take them Monday morning, four to six, and for seven years, I was there in front of the Blessed Sacrament, talking to our Lord, thanking Him for my life, asking him for help. My mother used to say, if you need answers to your life, go to the Blessed Sacrament. That's where you will get all the answers. So right after that, someone suggested that I write a book. I said, write a book? I said, what for? It was an Indian in an Indian reservation in California. I said, what should I want to write a book? He says, because people need to hear the miracles that God has wrought upon you. And what happened was that my life before that or throughout that period, Mamie, my wife Mamie, would take me to the airport on a Thursday. I would fly somewhere, Denver, Houston, wherever. She would pick me up on a Tuesday, and the first question she asked me, how did it go? Which is a normal question. I would answer, well, everything went fine. When you work with God, for God, and through God, everything went fine. But there's a lot of hungry people out there. They're looking for answers in their own places. They think they can find happiness and joy in a new car, a new home, a new job, a new marriage. And Mamie said very calmly, what they're looking for is for God. When they find God in their hearts, they will never be hungry again. Why don't you write a book someday and call it another kind of hunger? That makes sense. 
A month later, a man in California is dying of cancer. He said, I refuse to die till I see you in person. I said, I have no plans to go to California. So he said, well, I'm going to stay alive till I see you. Would you believe it? The next day, I got a free ticket to go to California. I spent five days with him. And he told me the same thing. Tony, you've got to write a book. There's a lot of hungry people out there. They need to hear about the miracles that God has showered upon you. So I decided to write a book, and I called it Another Kind of Hunger. That was my first book. It was a real book. By that, I mean a book book. And, and I printed, printed 5,000 5, copies myself, myself, and they're all gone, so I decided to record it into a two-tape, audio tape cassette called an audio book, and that's what's available here at my table. And then someone else suggested, why don't you write a book about the Blessed Mother? And I did, Mother of the Most Beautiful Love in the World. And the one who gave the name, the title to that book was her Holy Father, and let me tell you how it happened. The people of Peru in South America decided that they were going to order a very beautiful statue of the Blessed Mother in Spain. So when, so when they, they went, went to pick, pick up the statue, they decided to stop at the Vatican so the Holy Father could see it and bless it. And when the Holy Father, according to what they tell me, when he saw it, he looked at it and looked at it, and finally he said, definitely, this is the mother of the most beautiful love in the world. I said, wow, what a title. I'm going to write a book about it. So I wrote it. The thing that surprises me is that this book and the first book have gone all over the world. I got letters from the Philippines. I got it from Japan, from Vietnam, that they're enjoying the book. I have no idea how it got over there because I don't publicize it. Tell people, buy it, fine. If you don't buy it, fine. I wrote it because I wanted to share the love that the Blessed Mother had. This is what the greatness of God is all about. This is what we feel. I feel very strongly that we were born for greatness. All you have to do is open your hearts and your minds and your souls. Let God take over. It never fails. Never. Believe me. So, what happened after that? I decided that perhaps it was time for me to take control of my life totally and let God rule my life. And I think about it many, many times that uh, how much our Blessed Mother loves us, really, truly, truly loves us. She has come down from heaven so many times, in Tepeyac in Mexico, in Fatima, at Lourdes, in Nock in Ireland, and of course, Fatima and then in the other places that have not been approved by the Catholic Church, but they're not against our Catholic faith, like in Garavandal, in Trefontani, in Italy, and in Medjugorje, of course. And her message is always the same. Pray, pray, pray. Don't ask for peace. Go out and make peace. Fast. Do penance. Do abstinence. And our answer to her always seems to be the same. We seem to ignore her pleas. We seem to forget. Sometimes, Sometimes I wonder we even know how to do penance or make sacrifice. Doesn't it scare you that perhaps we have forgotten what it is to do penance and make sacrifices? The German poet, Goethe, he was a philosopher, he said, perhaps we should go back into the past for what we have learned from our parents. We have to learn all over again for ourselves or it will never be ours, never. And perhaps an Anglican minister who came from England, he was traveling all over the world. He, he said, said that, that what, what he found in America was the same thing he had found in England, in Australia, perhaps he even came through New Zealand, in Canada. He said, what I found in all these countries is a soft, plush, easy, materialistic way of living where Jesus Christ is always put in second place, if at all. And he said, at the rate we're moving, at the rate we're marching, it wouldn't surprise me if Russia and China, two communist countries, would be converted to a total Christianity before England and America. And he may be right. We wake, we wake up in the, the morning, morning, and instead of going down on our knees to thank God for the gift of life and the gift of a brand new day, what is it that we do while we're having breakfast or showering or shaving? We look out the window and we complain because outside is a lousy, miserable day. We complain because it's too hot or too cold, too wet or too dry, because the traffic moves too fast or too slow, because children yell, our neighbors talk too much or don't speak to us at all, because husbands and wives nag. And sometimes we complain of something so silly and so stupid that a cup of coffee or a cup of tea happens to be cold. And yet we tend to forget that in this year, this era, today, April the 29th, the year 2000, we still have three and a half Billion, not million, billion pagans in the world. Three and a half billion people who may lose their souls forever. It's been 2,000 years since our Lord walked on this earth. And after 2,000 years, this is our answer to him. That after 2,000 years, we still have three and a half million people who have never even heard the beautiful and precious name of Jesus Christ. Two-thirds of the population of the entire world are going to go to bed hungry tonight. And hundreds of people, men, women, and children have died over the centuries, not in auto accidents, not in diseases, not of hunger. They have died as martyrs, given their lives, defending their faith. 
and thousands more are still in prison behind communist countries, undergoing agonizing tortures and pains, like what happened to this poor Dominican priest in Africa. It was reported in the paper, maybe you read about it, where the communists decided to make fun of our Christianity, of our Catholicity, and they stripped this priest completely naked, they tied him to a tree, and then they decided to cut his body with a razor blade, inch by inch, so he could bleed slowly. Then they drove nails around the top of his head in mockery to the crown of thorns. They plucked out his eyes so he couldn't see. They cut off his tongue so he couldn't speak. And then they cut both arms right here at the elbow so he would never, ever be able to say mass again. And then they built him an altar, a very horrible, wooden, diabolical altar. They threw the poor, almost dead body on top of the altar. It's okay, priest, give us your mass. And this poor father, almost at the point of dead, he raises the stump of his arm with the blood still rushing out. He points it to where he hears the damnations and condemnations and blasphemies. He makes the sign of the cross. He forgives them. And then he dies. But you and I will wake up tomorrow morning and we will complain because outside is a lousy, miserable day. There are no lost and miserable days. Every day is perfect. If it's raining, it's supposed to rain. If it's hot, it's supposed to be hot. And if the coffee is cold, it is cold. It was St. Ignatius of Loyola who was walking down a country road in Spain and he fell on his knees and looked up towards heaven and says, God, forgive me, I must be crazy for I'm not a saint. And he was a saint. We don't want some future generation to pass by here in the year 2005 or 2010 and say, you who are here in the year 2000, what did you leave us as your legacy? What kind of example are we able to follow in this road, which happens to be the most important road, which is the salvation of souls? What are we going to tell them? Many people look at me and say, Tony, you look tired. I said, I am tired. You look exhausted. I said, I feel exhausted. Well, take it easy, Tony. You're traveling too much. You're doing too much. I tell them, as I'm telling you today, I'd rather be with people, talking to people, living with people, loving people, forgiving people, than watching television in the comfort of my living room because when my time comes that I have to face God, God's not going to ask me how much money did you make, how much titles and honors and degrees did you receive, how much power did you gain. He's going to ask each one of us one question and one question only. How much did you love with the years that I gave you? And I'm trying to live my life in such a way that perhaps, just perhaps, I might not have to answer him. If you forget everything that I've said in the last 40 minutes or so, but you remember this one final thing that I'm going to give you, that you can take it home with you, make it part of your life, part of your being, part of your very existence, I promise you, I sincerely promise you that you will receive your greatest blessing and I will achieve my greatest joy. And here it is. It makes no difference who you are or where you came from or where life or destiny takes you. Always, 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 in everything, remember, there must be love. Because where there is love, there's faith. Where there's faith, there's hope. And when you have this combination, this triple combination of faith, hope, and love, that's where you're going to find the joy, the beauty, the greatness, and the sanctity that we're all seeking and searching for. If no one had ever told you before, then let me be the first. If you never heard it before, then hear it today that you too were born for greatness and you should never ever settle for anything less. Perhaps one day, we too, when Saul was on his way to persecute Christians and he was knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus and he became Paul the Apostle, perhaps we too one day will be able to say with him, I am sure now that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor might, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God that God, which is our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for inviting me. God bless you. I'll pray for you. For those of you who were not here last night, I'm happy to be this week weekend here with you because I understand the canonization of Sister Faustina and I told the people last night that we have, we're, we're about to have two saints in Philadelphia. We already have the incorrupt body of Bishop Newman, St. Bishop Newman, who was the fourth bishop of Philadelphia who gave us the 40-hour devotion. He brought the Catholic schools to Philadelphia. 
And now on October the 1st, half of the city of Philadelphia will be in Rome for the canonization of Catherine Drexel. Catherine Drexel inherited from her, from her father, a multimillionaire man, at the age of 16, she received $20 million. She gave it all to the poor to work with the Indians and the black children in America. And uh, one of the sisters there, who was a very good friend of mine, my sister, uh, uh, Stanley Laws, used to tell him, said, Tony, when you talk about Catherine Drexel, tell him that she be, she's about to become a saint. Not because she gave away $20 million, but because she loved God more than anything else in life. And this is what we all have to do to become saints, because this is what we were born to do. In case you don't know it, from the day we were born until the day we die, our only duty, our only job, our only concern is that one day we become saints. Nothing else should matter except that. Thank you very much. God bless you.